believe you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that to worship God in spirit and truth, you must be filled with the Spirit. Confession of known sin is how we accomplish that. Just admitting to the Father what's going on with your life. It's about honesty as much as anything. No, acknowledging the price that was paid. And that's what forgives us. So let's go to the Lord. Take a moment. Prepare yourself. Confess sin if necessary. If you're in a struggle, if you're having a personal struggle with anger or frustration or fear or worry or jealousy, this would be a time to tell the Father that, to be honest, and ask Him for answers to help you. Well, Father, we do thank You for Your grace and mercy that's allowed us not only to be saved forever, to remove all fear and worry in that regard, but You've left us here as Your representatives to give Your message, to share the message of reconciliation. Be reconciled to God. And so in that light, Father, we come to prepare ourselves to continue to train ourselves and to free ourselves from that which would hinder our ability to perform that mission. Help us to understand the challenge that is, that is ours as we examine our own self in, in, in light of the mission. How can we represent you and become like Christ in yet still be dominated by the sin nature? Of course we can't. We must make choices and the Spirit has provided the means. Give us insight and understanding about how to live the Christian life, Father. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. All right. As usual, my desire is to help by explaining mechanics, how the Christian life works, what is it that the Holy Spirit has provided for us to be able to walk in the Spirit and live out the mind of Christ, and what is it that hinders us from doing so? We okay, John? Yeah. And what is it that keeps us or hinders us from being able to do that? Specifically for me, the question has always been, why is it so difficult to break free from this old way of life? You would think with the power that raised Christ from the dead living inside your body, with the principles and concepts of God's own mind indwelling us, inside of us, with the desire to do so, we should be free. We should have no struggle. And the outside world, the unbelieving world, thinks, you say you're a Christian? Well, why don't you act like one? You know, the number one complaint of non-believers toward believers is what? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. Because they don't understand that as a saved person, the struggle to live in this new man life, and, and the, as soon as you let go of the Spirit, you're sucked right back over into your old way. That quick, you're angry. That quick, you're fearful. And you're like, what is that? Why is that? I mean, it should be one of the great mysteries that I found early on was even with doctrine upon doctrine upon doctrine didn't free me from my anxieties or my depressions or my discouragement or my fearfulness about my future. It didn't free me from those things. And I thought it would. I thought it was supposed to. So it was a great mystery to me that I set about to, un to, to try to understand. And here I am. So I think I understand it a little better. So let's see if we can see what Paul has to say. If you turn to Romans chapter 6, if you'll do that in your Bibles, Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 and 7 and 8 are really, really key pivotal passages about this very question, because he's going to get into the back and forth, the inner conflict that becomes the life of the believer once you begin to learn and put principles of truth in your soul and try to live by them, you, you end up in this back and forth. In seven, he's going to say that the things that you desire to do and want to do, you often do the opposite. And it's like he said, it's, 
It's a mystery. It's like there's a law, there's a, the law of my flesh that still controls me. And he's going to tell us in chapter 6 why that is. So let's look at chapter 6, and we'll let me break it down a little bit. 1 through 11 is about positioning Christ in our true, two great possibilities. He's going to give us this concept that if you are in Christ, then you are identified with His death, burial, and resurrection. And because we're in the resurrection, in this new life, see, resurrected life is what Christ has. Of course, He had life, period. But we now are part of this resurrected life, and He calls it new life, a new life altogether. You know, eternal life. And we have the chance to live out in, in this phase of your existence, this new life, like he did. That's the goal for us, to live out this new life. Okay? But he's going he's gonna to explain that, wow, there's, this is a huge challenge. It's a possibility. It's only a possibility. Now, there's a lot of different theories, Christian theories, about how things work. Understand that there's some people in the Moody area, one supposedly leader that now can raise the dead, heal the sick, and, and teleport. <laughs> I know. Gary goes, what? That's what I said. Teleport. I don't know. A lot of different stuff out there, huh? We live in interesting times. In verses 1 through 11, he's going to talk about positioning Christ. He, he's asking these questions. This is all through the book of Romans, he asks these questions, these rhetorical questions. What shall we say then? Are we going to continue in sin that grace might increase? This was what he was being charged with. They said, you've, you've abandoned the law, and if you throw away the rule book, how are you going to get people to behave? If you don't have law and fear of punishment, how will you get people to do the right thing? And he said, grace will, grace will empower them and motivate them to do the right thing. See, the Christian life is not about rules. There are no rules. It's a love, life of love. It's love the Lord and, and live in that light. Love the Lord and do what pleases Him to the best of your ability. Surrender to the Spirit. Let Him lead you, guide you, listen to Him. And in doing so, you will live, you will live out this new man life. Listen, Christ followed all the Mosaic law, but He wouldn't have needed the law to live the way He did. He did not live the way He did because of fear of the law. You follow me? This is who he was. This is what he was. That was the essence of this person. Not only the God, but the man. This was his essence. This was his thinking. This was his value system. This is what he would have lived had there been no law. Law is no longer an issue. Law was simply a grace method of revealing the righteousness of God and our need for Christ. That's all it was. It was never something God knew we would follow or could follow it was never that. God has never operated off of rules. It's not rules. It's a life of living out this love for God and love for each other. That's the life. It's a love life. It's that simple. So we, we have, but look, our old way is not, that, is not like that. Our old way is competitive, and it's uh, performance-oriented, and it's, it's about earning and deserving and, and getting from me, me, me. That's our old life. And breaking out of that is quite a journey. So let's, let's look at this journey. So he's going to go on to say, Did you not know that all who have been baptized into Christ, that's union with Christ, have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, that just as he was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in this newness of life. And there's your first possibility. 
These are what these are subjunctive moods, which are possibilities. First John 1 9, if we confess, that's a possibility. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. That's a subjunctive mood. So he says, you don't have to walk in newness of life. You can be saved and secure and not walk in newness of life. But if you want to, if you decide to, it's here's the possibility. It's all set up for you. Listen, whole Christian life is set up for us. Holy Spirit does everything, boils everything down, empowers everything so that moment by moment we get to decide whether we're going to believe what God says or what our old way says or what the world says. Walk by faith or walk by sight. It boils down to that every moment of your life, moment by moment by moment. And whichever one you believe in the moment is the one you're going to do. If you want to know what you really are believing, just look at what you do. It's that simple. So the Spirit's laid it all out. That's newness of life. That's what, that's what he later on, Paul calls the new man. So new life in Christ, the new man, this is verse 4, God, the Holy Spirit, creates or baras a sphere of being that enables spiritual understanding, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 16, and produces the divine character of Christ. And this divine character is in God's pattern in righteousness and holiness from the truth. So, he baras this, see, we're spiritually dead, worldly programmed, and you believe in Christ, and he baras this whole new man in you. He indwells you, he creates the capacity to understand spiritual phenomena, to live it out under the power of the Holy Spirit. Man, all of a sudden, you're fulfilling the law, you're living like Christ when you're filled with the Spirit. It's a miracle incredible miracle that we can do that at all. And every time you confess your sins and you yield back to the Spirit, you're in that place. You're in that place of spiritual existence. So, He creates that. And, and by Ba-Ra, He creates it out of nothing, just like He created the world, the universe. He creates it out of Himself. It's not something that He makes. Here's the point. It's katesis in the Greek. It's Ba-Ra. The, here's the point. He doesn't make it out of what's already existing in you. What's already existing in us is irredeemable. Just, just you. The only thing that's redeemed is you. Your body, your brain, your whole system that you've used your whole life going to the grave. Only you, your soul, now can enter into this sphere. Bob Thiem called it a dinosphere, a power sphere where you're in this sphere and you can live this spiritual life through the power of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit, when filled with the Spirit, the believer fulfills the righteous conditions of the law. That's Romans 8, 4. The filling of the Spirit produces the divine nature of Christ in the believer, enabling us to learn and live based on the same mindset of Jesus. This is 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Walking in the new life is the same idea as putting on the new man. Ephesians 4.24. Then he's going to go to verse 6. What's really verse 5 is important. Let's read verse 5. He says, For if we become united with him, this is positional truth, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So you got that. All right, We're, we, we died with him on the cross positionally. That's retroactive positional truth. We died with him. We were resurrected with him. And because we were resurrected with him, we've got this new life that's available to us. But this new life has a great challenge, a great hindrance. He says in verse 6, Knowing this, that our old self, this is the old man, was crucified with him, and you think, listen, here's what everybody says. Well, your old man was crucified. That means it's dead. It's just dead, right? Watch this. It was crucified with him so that our body of sin, our flesh, shouldn't no, wait. That our body of sin might be done away with, future possibility that we should no longer be servants to sin. 
Here's your second great possibility. So, the old self was positionally crucified with Christ, but not practically. Practically, it's still in you. And this is the great challenge of the Christian life, is to understand that the reason we can't just freely live the Christian life, that we're constantly fighting this enemy within, is this thing is programmed into, your, into the cells of your body, into your brain, into the neurons of your brain. It's, that's why Paul calls it the flesh. It's the body. It's in the body. You're stuck in this body. And this body was born into corruption. It was developed and programmed in corruption. And one day you got saved, and now you have this ability to be free, but you're still saddled, connected to this old system. And he's going to tell us what to do with it. He said it has to be done away with. Done away with. And I'll get to that. So that word, to be, to be done away with, means to tear down, to render inoperative, to pull apart. It has a lot of means, but it's all about destroying, getting rid of. So, verse 6, tearing down the old man. The old self was crucified with Christ, giving us posi positional victory over the flesh. Okay? Positional victory. We're free from it in heaven. We're sitting in Christ, sitting at the right hand of the Father, and we're free positionally, eternally, permanently free. You're never going to, in heaven, you'll never fit, deal with this again. But here, this is part of, the, your old self is the course in which you travel. It's the, it's the challenges. Listen, life's the same for everybody just about. Your gift may make it a little different, but everybody has relationships and everybody, most people are married, and most people have kids, most people deal with old age and health issues and financial. Everything's basically the same for all of us. But what makes your challenge different? i tell you what makes it different is what's inside of you. What's in you. So, this old self was positionally crucified, but positional victory in Christ, see this is another subjunctive, sets up the potential for practical victory in daily life. Practical victory is why we're here. If positional victory was all, we'd have gone to heaven. Boom. You get saved, whoosh, you're gone. But that's not the way it works. You get saved and you've left here. Left here for what? For what? Listen, part of the for what is to overcome this old way in your life. That's part of it. And you go, well, well look, I don't, I don't steal and I don't cheat. You know, I don't lie. You know, I don't spit, whatever, go with girls that do, blah, blah, blah. But what about insecurity? Um, and what about fearfulness? What about anxiety? What about those kind of things? You see, those are a deeper level of sin that we deal with. They're a deeper level of being disoriented to the plan of God. Do you think Christ was anxious, depressed, discouraged? I mean, he got down a little bit, but he never let it get him down. But we do. This is the deep level of the things that we fight to overcome. And this is important because you can say, well, I but conquered the flesh because I don't do overt or even verbal sins. But what about your mental sins and the logic behind your mental sins? If you just hang on to that, if you're just a superficial, if you, all you've gained is superficial victory, and you stand before Christ and go, well, I won the war. You're going to say, well, what about all those years you spent hiding and discouraged and afraid to be who you were and afraid to really tell people about me? I mean, it seems I've gotten better about it. I still go through phases where I don't want to talk to people in public. That's just my nature. But most of the time now, I've come out of myself and I engage people about Christ, no matter where I am, in the, in the supermarket, you know, in all the bars I frequent. I'm just kidding. 
Rhonda would kill me. Uh, everywhere I go, I'm more open because I know that's why I'm here. That's what I'm here for. So I'm trying to do more of my job to be more open and connect with people. I'm learning now to just not just blurt out stuff. Do you know how to get saved? And they're like, try to stop and have a little bit of engagement with a person to connect with them a little bit and, and, and in, in, engage with them to try to lead this. So I'm trying to get more out of me and more into this new man place where I can be this new man and I can love people and they can see that in me and they, I can care about them and they can see that in me. They sense it. I want to be that guy. I know you want to be that person too. Well, how do we get there? I mean, is it just one more Bible study? And where you're going you're gonna to go over the edge and, be, be, and arrive? I don't think so. So, it's salvation, practical victory over the effects. See, we're talking about the effects of Adam's sin. What are all the effects of Adam's sin? A sin nature? We know that. All right, we're condemned. 13 judicial charges, right? Salvation takes those away. All right? We have a sin nature. It's, where is that located? In the body. Not going to get rid of that. That's going to be with us till we leave this body. And also, what I want you to understand is that as you were growing up and developing your ideas about life, that you programmed a lot of stuff into yourself, into your mind, into your brain. That's why it's the flesh that are part of this whole challenge in your life. That's why it's so difficult to get away from these things. So, it's salvation, practical victory over the effects of Adam's sin is only potential based on understanding the old, old man operating system and the use of the divine assets from the Holy Spirit to break free from habituated slavery. Let me give you a tip. Everything about the human system works on habit. It's all habit. You, you, you take on a new behavior and you do it again and again and again and again. And before you know it, supposedly in 21 days, it becomes a habit. Your brain, every time you think a thought, your brain builds a neuron to represent that thought and you connect them up day after day after day. And the next thing you know, you got a pathway in your brain that represents that idea and it turns into an automatic behavior. That's, that's why these old things that we deal with, you've been doing them for so long, maybe, maybe most of your life. You've been looking at things crossways based on something your father said or did or you know, something you saw or experienced, you know, he got you all twisted and turned around and you're looking at life in a certain way. And that stuff's still in there. And so you hear you're over trying to live the new man and that stuff keeps popping up. Every time a certain thing happens, it, it fires off. Your brain fires it off. It's just the way it works. So, all right. Grace has provided everything we need for victory dependent on our life choices. <clears throat> our permanent summary, our permanent position in Christ opens up both temporal and eternal possibilities for us. Phase two, practical life, is all potential and possibilities dependent upon the believer's volitional choices. Everything's, a, everything's based on your choice. You get to be who you want to be. In fact, you are who you have chosen to be. <laughs> I used to try to fix my mother. My mother was like the great challenge in my life. And <laughs> so for years and years, she was always depressed. I mean, she's dead and in heaven now, so I can talk about her. Uh, so, and I would try to cheer her up. You know, I would try to fix her. I was, that's how I became a fixer. Uh, and one day, I was probably close to 30 years old, I went to visit her, and she was, in, you know, usually in her little sad place and everything, and I, I, I had been learning a lot of this stuff, and I looked over at her, and I was about to go over and start doing my fixing routine, and I realized, you know, she is who she has chosen to be. Nothing I'm going to do is change that. She, only, only she can change that. If she decides to be 
somewhat different within herself. She can change it. God has provided everything she needs. Nothing I say or do is ever going to cause that to happen. Now, I'm not saying don't encourage people or minister to people. I'm just saying everybody decides. And, and who you are today is who you've chosen to be. If you don't like the way you are, then God has got a whole system of possibilities for you. But it's based on your willingness to choose. Not the church or where it's located. Any of that stuff. The pastor or who's teaching or what they're teaching. All that's relevant in its own place. But you and I have to choose who and what we're going to be. God made it that way. We have to choose. So it's all possibility. It's all based on volition. Grace provides for all of our permanent and practical needs. There's nothing that you need that you don't have. Not, 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 not spiritually, not eternally, not personally, not emotionally. You say, well, you don't know. I'm talking to the Internet. You don't know how bad my relationships are. No, but I bet the people you're in relationships do. I bet they know how bad you are. But look, you, you can't change the outside. All you can change is the inside. All Listen, all you have to do is change the inside to have an impact on the outside. This is all about the whole focus of the spiritual war is on your soul, your choices. Everything boils down to that. So if you stay in a place of discouragement or, or grief or depression or anxiety, if you stay there on and on and on, that's a choice. You go, well, that's no, a choice. God has provided the means for you to break free of that, to break that habit and form a new one. See, that's the nuts and bolts of growth. So, Paul explains, let's see. So, God has provided everything. Paul explains from chapter 6, verse 12, all the way through the end of chapter 7, that consistent choosing causes habituation, habits. Habits and patterns of thinking to which we give control, he calls it being enslaved. He calls it being a servant. So, let's get into that. Let's go over to chapter 6, verse 12. 12 through 14 talks about who rules, who's in charge, the rulership of the sin nature. He says, therefore, no longer allow sin or the sin nature or the old man system to reign or rule your mortal body, that you should obey its desires and stop, and, and do, and stop presenting or yielding the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. See, that's all the sin side. Stop doing the sin side. Chapter 12, verse 2 is going to say, stop being conformed to the world. Same idea. But instead, yield yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. So you see the choice? You got a system you were born with and you developed out of the world. It's your, it's your, it's your default system. It's your, it's your habit of life. It's how you've lived your life. You know, if you're afraid to talk to people or, you know, say you're an extrovert and you're, you know, just out there with people, those are habits of life. It's a natural inclination that you've turned into a habit of life. So with me, I'm inward and sort of reticent to come out and be connected. I have to push myself out. I have to say no to that fear because it's a fear. I mean, it's a natural inclination that early in my life I turned into, we called it being shy. It's just fear. Being shy is fear. Fear of what? Fear of not being liked, fear of rejection. Fear of not being something that people want. So you visualize that and you tell yourself, be careful. 
Don't say anything. Don't say something stupid. You know, of course, that's a, you, you could chart my life on the stupid things I've said. I'm just not kidding you. I mean, I mean, right from this pulpit, I've said a bunch of stupid things. But anyway, I'm trying to get past it. He says, your choice to let sin reign in your body, or you can use your volition to let God reign in your body. He says, for sin, in verse 14, sin shall not be your master, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now, what does that mean? Took me a long time to understand. See, sin uses rules. When the issue for you is, am I breaking the rules? Am I committing sin? And that's your focus. Your focus is to not commit sin. You follow? Your, your Christian life is about not committing certain sins. And you think, I'm do I've done it. I mean, I've gotten better and better about the overt and the verbal. And sometimes I can't even be joyful and, and, and content. I've done it. I've, I'm not sinning. You realize that if you played any game that way, your whole goal would be to not lose? You think, look, who's already won the game? We've already won. We don't have to worry about not losing. Look, sin is not the point. Sin is not the issue. Sin's already paid for. The not sinning focus is a misdirected way of your, using your energy to do something that doesn't matter that much anyway. Now, I'm not proposing that you sin. See, this is what Paul, they kept charging Paul. You're telling people it's okay to sin. He's going, not at all. Not at all. He said, it's just not the point. The point is the new man, living in the new man, focusing on the new man. You only focus on the old man when it drags you back out of the new man. You let go of the new man and whoosh, you're back over here in the old man. You go, well, how do I get free from that? He's going to tell you, you take it off. You delete the thing, piece at a time. You, you say no to those habits that keep pulling you back over here into whatever mental sin that is your flavor. You know, I mean, mine through the years uh, have been more di be discouraged and depressed and be angry. I don't have a lot of fear about things. You know, I don't, I don't need a lot of uh, applause for what I do. So, but if I, you know, my, my issues, my, when I get over here, it's, I'm discouraged, you know. I feel discouraged about things. And, and part of that's a genetic, biological brain thing, and part of it's just a choice to keep thinking and looking at my life from that old perspective. I don't have to do that. I can recognize that and say no to that. Say no to that. Then I have to say yes to God. The issue is saying yes to God. The issue is not being, de not being depressed. The issue is being joyful in Christ. But every time I let go of Christ, I'm depressed. So how do I break that habit? That's, the, that's my study. So that's what I want to share with people. That's, what I, that's one thing I don't think has been developed well. All right. In verse 12, he says, Stop allowing your sin nature to reign or rule your mortal body that you should obey its desires. And this word basaluo, present active imperative plus the negative, means to stop something that's already in progress. From the moment of your human birth to the moment of your new birth, the sin nature was in control of your life. Simple, right? That was all it could be. So, the word means to rule a kingdom, to be in charge, to be in control. He says that you should obey, to hear and obey, it, it's lust or it's desires. And the word epithemia is the word for intense desire. It's often translated lust, but sometimes it's translated normal desire. Like Christ used this word when he talked about, I've been, I've been wanting to eat this Passover dinner with you, and he uses epithemia. So it doesn't mean, the word doesn't mean lust. 
It means really strong desire and depends on what you've attached it to. So, verse 13. And stop, don't go on presenting, yielding the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. The word present or pyristomy means to yield, to present, to make available, to surrender, uh, to put at someone's disposal. And it indicates here to yield to the spirit, I mean to yield to the sin nature or to yield to God. Listen, we don't do a lot of act, active, active thinking. We yield. We're yielders. You got two power systems. You got this one over here, the devils, that's, just, that's in you from the world that you programmed into your even your brain that you keep going back to. You yield to that one. And the key to it is desire. You have a desire and you can either fulfill it the old way, you know, ice cream. That's what it's come down to me, you know. <laughs> At a certain point, that's all that's left. Or you can go to the Holy Spirit and surrender to Him and enjoy all of the wonders of God. Those are your options. But look, it's not about you. It's about yielding. It's a yielding. It's a wonderful thing. It's simple. Which one are you going to yield to? Now, which one do you normally yield to? You go, well... When you're talking about the overt sins, I got that one. When you're talking about the verbal sins, most of the time I got that one. When you're talking about the mental sins, that's a whole other matter. So, to yield means to place at one's disposal. It's the mechanics of choosing for the sin nature or the filling of the Spirit. Yielding, listen, confession of sin breaks you free it's, it's God's signal to break you free to let you be free from that old and you get back in the spirit but you're just in neutral you're in neutral you have to yield there's a yielding there's a listening to, there's a being influenced there's a staying with there's a staying with so yielding is determined by, by faith what, what we believe in the moment will best serve us. In other words, here's how you decide. Here's the simplicity of this. You have a desire for something. You know, I get up 9.30 at night and I'm trying to eat less, which is really a funny thing, but you know, I go in, the, in there to the kitchen and I stand and look in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes thinking that something's miraculously going to form in there that's going to make my desire go away. But I can either decide to eat something and please my flesh or I can stay in the spirit. And it's not, divine, it's not human discipline. It's to, it's to meet that hunger it, with him. Let him meet that hunger. To yield to him. Because he's like, you don't need to eat anything. That's a distraction from me. That's your old way. It's you giving in to your old way. So, it's which one you believe in the moment is going to best serve you. You go, Lord, I know, I know, I know. But I believe that chocolate cake I just believe if I had a taste of that right now, that that would shoot me right over the moon. You go, yep, right up to 260 pounds. So I'll just shoot you right over the moon. Now, let's go to verse 16. He says, do you not know that when you yield yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, that you become the slave of the one whom you obey? either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. The word slaves, doulao, means a compulsive choosing to surrender yourself to the sin nature or to God. See, this is the principle of habits. Once you give yourself to something over and over and over, 
it becomes a habit and you become, it becomes automatic behavior. You automatically do that. That's what he's taught. Yes, that's slavery. You give yourself over to it by doing it again and again and forming the habit. Okay? That's the key to this thing. The key is habit. Breaking the habit or making the habit. It's that simple. Really, you, your, your whole life operates off habits. To break these habits, you have to become intentional with your life. You have to wake up. He says, awaken sleeper, and Christ will shine on you. Wake up to what's going on within you and pay attention to what you're telling yourself and believing, giving into, yielding to. Pay attention to that. But see, we don't. We don't really pay attention to what's going on inside of us, not as a rule. We're fo outwardly focused on circumstances and improving our circumstances and getting more of this and less of that. That's our focus. The real war is inside. The real war is not out here. That stuff's changeable. It changes every day. All that stuff changes. Your opportunities, your circumstances, your situations, people in your life, all that changes every day. It's going to change all the way through to the end. It's all going to change constantly. The thing that's the focus is what's inside of you. What's going on in here? That's your role. That's your job is what's going on in here. Your job is not to control what's going on outside of you. Your job is to control what's going on inside of you. It's that simple. That's the war. And he says, when you yield yourself, which is an inner choice, you become a slave. Verse 19 speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, just as you yielded your body as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, causing ever-increasing levels of lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So when you yield to something, you will obey it. If you do that, Consistently, you will become enslaved to it, which means you, have, you will habituate a pattern of yielding to the, the sin nature or yielding to God. See, the new man works the same way. Once you, once you practice walking in the Spirit as a rule over time, it becomes your habit of life. You live in the Spirit. It becomes difficult. Ron said it the other day. It becomes difficult to tell the difference between you and the Spirit. Because you're so inundated with spirit life. And that's wonderful. That's what you're after. But this back and forth thing, that's not necessary. We can overcome that back and forth. Then he says, look, whatever you give yourself to and become enslaved to, you can't be satisfied with the simplicity of that. It becomes an ever-increasing cycle. And this is the old pursuit of happiness gratification you know oh one little piece of pie and you're good but the next time it's got to be a little bigger piece of pie you know and a little bigger piece of pie and now you're up to the whole cake hello it's just the way desire works it's the same with the spirit you know you give your desire you yield yourself to the spirit and you enjoy this and you love that and you want more of it and more of it and more, it becomes a life journey, right? Look, if walking in the Spirit was the, war, was the most awful thing you ever did in your life, it, you hated it, it was hurtful and discouraging and pounded you, would you keep doing it? I don't think so. It'd be really hard. It'd be really hard to do, but it's wonderful, Peaceful, content, love comes out of you. So, position in Christ creates the possibilities of living in the new man belief system. Yielding in the moment, which is the choice or action, resulting from believing either the lies produced by the old man beliefs or the truth produced by the Holy Spirit and knowledge of the Word of God. Yielding means to give in to one or the other. You give in. And what you know what drives you? Desire. 
Desire is the key to your life. You're going to desire. You can't help but desire. You're made and driven by wanting. Jesus called it hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst is the normal human motivation system. You're made with needs. You're made empty. There's a vacuum in the middle of your heart. John 7, 37 through 39. It's the empty place that out of this comes this hunger. And you're either going to try to gratify that hunger with the old system, the flesh, or you're going to give that hunger to the Lord and, and progress in the new man. This, it's your hunger. You should hunger for God. You go, well, I don't. First Peter 2, 2, who knows what that says? Like newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word so that by it, the milk, you may grow in respect to your salvation. Did you know the word desire is an imperative, is a command? You're commanded to desire that milk. It's not that you naturally desire it. You're commanded to desire it. You're commanded to tell yourself every day, I want that. I need that. I got to get that. Well, you don't get up every single morning of your life and go, man, I just can't wait to get to church. No, you have to make yourself go. So, yielding is the in-the-moment choice resulting from what you believe. Either you believe the lies of the old system or you believe the truth of the new. You surrender your volition to act out beliefs formed under the influence of the sin nature or the influence of the Holy Spirit. The word enslaved discusses choices. These choices become habits that through consistent use become cycles and patterns. You wonder why your relationships work in cycles. I mean, you come back, always come back to the same place. You go through this cycle and, and the complaints are always the same. The proposed solutions end up being the same. And then you go back through your cycle. It's just cycles. Those are your relationships. Why is that? Because these are the ideas that you programmed in your brain to keep firing off, and you've given yourself over to that process, to that, and you're enslaved to that, and so it just takes you through it. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have the power to look at that and stop and break those patterns. I mean, is everything wonderful, super duper great in your life all the time? Anybody? Why not? You're saved forever. You're spiritual forever. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit forever. You're going to be with Christ forever. <laughs> you're, going to have, you're going to have a superman body. You know, you're just waiting in line to get there. So what is it? This is the question for me. What is it? Because we, we in this church know what we have. We know what's available. We know what we can do. We've learned it. What's hindering us from being super duper Christian people? And maybe you are super duper Christian people. I'm not. I'm not. I'm better. I'm farther. I'm, I'm less worrisome. I'm less irritated, I'm less frustrated, I'm more content because I keep removing these things that cause me, that, that, that pull me back out of the spirit place. I keep getting rid of that stuff. I look for the root of it and I go, What's cause, what am I telling myself that makes me feel this way and act this way? Why do I get frustrated with my relationships? Why do I get frustrated with my body? All of this is part of a program, a plan that God's laid out in front of me. Why am I still fighting against God? What is it that I've attached my want and hunger to that says it should be different? That's the stuff that has to go. When you learn how to get rid of it, and it only, you can only do a little at a time, when you get rid of it, you know what it does? It frees you to stay over here. It frees you. You don't go back over there so much. So 
To be enslaved, the choices become habits, consistent use that become cycles and patterns that turn into automatic reactions, sinful or even righteous. The immaterial soul makes choices that causes, causes the body to change. Your body records choices and forms patterns. I mean, every part of your body. You eat a certain thing all the time and your body will adjust to it. It will try to be healthy even if you're not treating it in a good way. You exercise consistently, your body will react to it. It will respond to it. Same with your brain. If you treat your brain intentionally, deal with your brain and your thoughts in an intentional matter, you'll be able to break old patterns that have controlled you maybe your whole life and, and walk in the Spirit. It's choice. The brain forms neural systems that fire automatically when faced with stimuli, automatic reactions. This is pretty new science. Last 10 to 15 years, they've learned these things through PET scans by watching the brain function under certain circumstances. And they do all these tests, these tests and, these, uh, and they watch how it works. Carolyn Leaf is the lady that's really kind of leader in that. But your brain forms these neural systems that fire automatically. And listen, just because you learn something new that counteracts what you learned before or believed before, it doesn't mean that goes away. Your brain has formed a neural pathway and that thing keeps wanting to fire. When you used to face a circumstance with anger, now the Spirit says, be calm, be peaceful, trust God. This whole anger system is still in place. That's why it's still there for you to go back to. That's why when you're caught unawares or you're not intentional in your life, boom, you're over here and you're mad before you know it. You go, How? why did that happen? Why does it keep happening? Why can't I walk away from that? It's in your flesh. He calls it the flesh. It's in your brain. You go, well, what do I do about that? Do I just suppress all that? Try to keep it all pushed down? Good luck with that. That's like whack a -mole. You knock that one down and another one pops up. So, I never had a weight problem when I smoked. Right? Took it out on the cigarettes. Dang, I'm going to kill you. You know, then when I threw that away, it was like, whew, my lungs said, thank you, thank you, thank you. But my belly said, mmm. <laughs> mm. The Holy Spirit said, neither one of those had a spiritual benefit whatsoever. You just traded one for the other. So, enslaved. Your brain is formed enduring neural pathways from what you chose to believe and do. These networks that continue to function unconsciously even after you have believed something contrary to those ideas. This is why the old stuff just hangs on. We initially developed ideas about life, love, and happiness from the world around us and, in, and under the influence of the sin nature. We stored those ideas in our brain, the flesh. Salvation doesn't wipe out those habituated neural pathways. That's why the stuff just endures. I've been, in, I, I've been saved and growing 44 years now. And I still have stuff that came right out of my childhood. Still have ideas and thoughts and feelings and goals and priorities that I've had my whole life. Ever-increasing yieldingness. This is habituation becomes pursuit of happiness. Well, you can read the rest of this. I hope this is helpful to you. I say all this again and again because these things are so difficult to grasp. And trying to say these things clearly so that you realize what, what your actual situation is. We've, we've never, we don't dig into this sin aspect enough to understand how this thing keeps grabbing hold of us. So, if you've broken, broken free from your sin nature and the patterns of your sin nature, I, I salute you. And, and maybe it's just me. 
Is it me, Gary? No? I mean, you still struggle with your stuff? A little bit? Yeah, me too. Let's go to the Lord. Father, I want to thank you for understanding, helping me understand, helping us understand what we're challenged with, what we're faced with, and why this challenge continues to be in front of us to return to our vomit. That doesn't sound appealing to me, but yet I do it all the time. I'm, all, I, I'm already caught in it, trying to break free from it permanently, as permanently as possible in this life. I pray that these things are helpful to those who also share that goal of wanting to live out the Christian life, not just have knowledge, not just have information, but are wanting to put this into their life in a way that their character changes, their, their inner self changes. They become lighter, freer, more joyful, more content, more peaceful, tranquility of soul. These things come only through application of being able to beat these old patterns of thinking and, and believing. So make these things understandable, Father. Uh, we love you. We pray for Ron and Deanna and get, bring them back safely. Pray for the new venture that we're into, the new place, the new ministry where things are happening. Uh, Father, I thank you for this church in Arkansas that just baptized uh, where 396 people got saved this last month. There seems to be a surge, a spiritual surge. And I pray, Father, for that I ask that you not let us go down like this, but bring us back through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if this is the end, then prepare us. Give us the courage to face it and to stand firm. We love you. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.